Good evening and welcome to tonight's PSIT webinar. I'm Brian Farrell and tonight's webinar is on CompTIA's A plus exam 220-801 and we will be covering objectives 1.8 and 1.9. As I said, my name is Brian Farrell and I am the certificate mentor for the PSET program, TNI, Technology and Integration Support. And if you have any questions this evening, go ahead and feel free to ask them and I will do my best to answer them. And with that, let's go ahead and begin tonight's webinar. So what are objectives 1.8 and 1.9? Well, objective 1.8 is the introduction to the power supply and 1.9 is custom hardware configurations. So let's begin by introducing you to the power supply. And where do we start? Well, we start by talking about electricity and we'll start with alternating current. Alternating current is the common source of AC that comes from your wall socket. And it is the, and its standard unit of measurement is the volt. AC is used because it is a better medium for transmitting, particularly over long distance. Alternating current means that the flow of electrical charge changes periodically. It reverses back and forth which is represented by a wave. The reversal cycle is measured by the frequency of its change, how frequently it changes, and is represented by its hertz, that is the cycles per second. The most common wall current in the United States and Canada is 110 to 120 volts at a 60 hertz cycle. The most common wall current in other countries of the world is 220, 220 to 230 volts at a 50 hertz cycle. Now DC on the other hand stands for direct current and it's and the common source for DC is converted AC power or batteries. Uh, DC is a constant is a constant power. There is no reversal cycle. DC works best for applications that need to store an electrical charge or that require the constant power characteristics of DC. Uh, electronics are a good are an application that really do require the constant power characteristics of DC. So now let's move on to the actual power supply. So the, we'll start with the power supply's job description. What is, what is its job? Well, its job is to take the AC wall current and change it to the appropriate DC currents for the PC and to do so and supply it in the right amounts through the right plugs. A common common PC components voltage requirements. So what does the PC commonly need? Well, it needs a positive 3.3 volts, it needs positive 5 volts, it needs a positive 12 volts, and it needs a negative 12 volts. Yes, you can have a negative electrical charge and the power supply is responsible for taking the wall current in alternating current and supply it in the negative 12 volt DC current. Now power supplies are rated by the watts that they can supply. Now the watt is a power, is a measurement, excuse me, is a unit of measure for electricity and watts can be determined if you know what your voltages are and what your amperage requirements are. The actual fo formula is volts times amps equals watts. So if you have 12 volts, a uh, requirement of 12 volts and 5 amps, you would need 60 watts of power. 
Now let's talk about common PC power connectors. There is the 24-pin main motherboard power connector. Now this supplies 3.3, 5, and 12 volts, and negative 12 volts. And it is the most common main power connector for the ATX form factor. Then there's also a 20-pin 20 pin main power connector, uh, performs the same functions, supplies the same voltages, and it, and it is the most common power connector for the micro ATX form factor. <clears throat> then there are the four or eight pin auxiliary, auxiliary motherboard power connector. Uh, today's CPUs are a whole lot more power hungry than those in the past and they require more power than the motherboard can supply. So it is the power supplier's job to supply the power. And it supplies additional positive 12 volts directly to the CPU. There are also the four pin Molex connector and the Molex connector is supplies 5 volts and 12 volts. And it's used by peripheral devices and fans. And there are bird connectors. Uh, these are kind of flat. They supply 5 volt and 12 volts. And those, the bird connector is actually for a floppy disk drive. You probably won't see too many of those in today's modern PCs. Then there is the SATA connector. Now this supplies 3.3 volts and 5 volts and 12 volts. And it's used by peripheral devices like hard disk drives and optical drives. And then finally we have the 6 or 8 pin PCI auxiliary power connector supplying 3.3 and 12 volts an additional 3.3 and 12 volts two PCI add-on cards, so the ones that require it. And in particular, that would be video cards. The PCI bus just can't supply enough power for those things, so it's the power supply's job to do so. So how do you pick the right power supply? Well, you need to know what form factor you're using. Um, ATX, micro ATX, and ITX use different standard sizes of power supplies. Know your voltage requirements. Are you in the United States and Canada, or are you going to mo mo most of the rest of the world? Now, some power supplies can switch or be switched between standard voltages, and some cannot. The power supply that I have pictured here is one that can tell what kind of current is coming in, and it will automatically switch internally to determine, it'll actually switch internally based on what it receives from the outside, but not all power supplies can do that. Now you also need to know what's going on inside the case, the type of motherboard, uh, the CPU, and the number and types of peripherals that are present will all make a difference in the, A, the connectors that you have and the size of the power supply that you need. You should know that your wattage requirements. <clears throat> it's better to have more watts available and not need them than to need more watts and not have them. A lot of people don't realize this, but it's just as hard, if not harder on elect well, not harder, but um, it's awfully hard on electric electronic equipment when it's in a low wattage environment, a brownout environment. You can actually burn out your equipment as it tries to draw more power if you're not supplying it with the right amount of watts. So know your wattage requirements. As a general rule, you should be 50% or your power supply should be rated for 50% or higher than the wattage requirements of all of your components. Just to be safe, 50%, that should keep you safe. And that about covers it for the PC power supply. So now let's move on to custom hardware configurations.
which is Objective 1.9 of the CompTIA exam, A plus exam 220-801. And where do we begin? Well, we begin by talking about custom configurations for work, and we're going to start with the standard desktop, also known as a thick client. These should meet the recommended hardware specifications for running the proposed operating system. As I said, the re meet the recommended specifications, not the minimum specifications. Your CPU should come from the mid to upper mid range of the manufacturer's line. And the amount of RAM that is installed, if you decide to exceed um, the recommended specification, don't go under, but if you decide to exceed, will be limited by the type of OS excuse me, type of operating system that you're using. A 32-bit operating system has a maximum RAM limit of 4 gigabytes. Keep that in mind. Then there is the thin client. Thin clients are your, uh, you will find thin clients where most applications and files are accessed and stored on central servers, allowing the system to only need need to meet the minimum requirements of the operating system. In this case, minimum requirements are just fine. Uh, something to keep in mind, though, you might want to keep enough resources or design or build in enough resources into the system that so that they can perform basic or, or run basic applications. But it's not a requirement of the thin client as a general rule. So now let's move on to the graphic computer, or the graphic design workstation, or the CAD workstation, or the CAM workstations. That would be computer-aided design or computer-aided manufacturing design workstation. This is a workhorse type system and should be built with power in mind. The CPU should be more powerful and should come from the Mac from the manufacturer's line line that is designed for heavy workloads. They do have those. Um, they tend to be more expensive than your consumer grade, but believe me, you want it in these systems. Uh, these systems also handle extremely large files that have a ton of data, so the maximum amount of RAM that you can put into the machine should be included. Believe me, CAD and CAM files get really large. Uh, you're better off to have an excess of RAM than to not have enough because, man, it'll slow you up. These systems also require at least one high-end or specialized video card in order to function properly. Now let's move on to the audio vivid audio video editing workstation. These are closely related to the design workstations that I just talked about a moment ago, but there are a few things, few other things to keep in mind. These also require very large and very fast storage, especially if you're editing video. So you want in your SSD, your solid state drive in most cases, while it's fast enough, usually won't be large enough. Although I suppose you could use a 256 gigabyte solid state storage to get fast enough, but usually that's still not enough. So if you're going to use a spinning platter hard drive, I would recommend using a 15,000 RPM high quality enterprise grade hard drive. Uh, these also require specialized audio and video cards, and the video card or cards need to be capable of driving at least two monitors. These systems still require powerful CPUs and a lot of RAM. Now let's talk about the virtualization workstation. And what we're talking about doing is this is the machine that will be running your virtual machines. And there are two keys to this configuration, the CPU and the RAM. 
Now, the CPU should come from the upper end of the power spectrum, as in uh, faster, and it should have as many cores as can be purchased and the client can afford. Uh, just when I was preparing this presentation, I did a really quick search, and AMD's Operton series can come with up to 16 cores on your CPU. Now, that would be really handle if really handy if you were running multiple virtual machines. Also, you need to include the maximum amount of RAM. That's because each individual virtual machine will be held by and operate within the RAM. And all your virtual machines share the, ver the RAM that's on the workstation. So the more RAM you have, the better off you are. Now let's move on to custom configurations for play. And we will begin this one by talking about the gaming PC. Modern gaming tends to be about the user experience. And that all begins with the PC. And that means that the PC has some specific requirements. The CPU should come from the high end of the consumer range. And because of the nature of gamers, you want an unlocked CPU. That means you want a CPU that the user can overclock. Modern games also tend to be graphics intensive. So at the minimum, you need an, an upper tier graphics card. Uh, Included with the system, you might actually want to consider using two or three matched graphics cards to improve the gaming experience even more. A high quality sound card will also enhance the experience. And as gaming, as the, and as hardcore gamers and games tend to tax the system, you might want to uh, install increased cooling capacity, uh, larger fans, more robust fans, or even water cooling. Now let's talk about your standard home PC. In most cases, the home PC has the same requirements as the thick client that I started off the discussion with, so the standard desktop uh, should, meet, should meet the recommended specifications for the operating system in which it will run. Now let's talk about the home theater PC. In most home theater PC applications, the CPU and RAM only play a minor role, so their importance is, minimal, is minimized. Uh, you don't need a powerful CPU. You don't need a whole lot of RAM. Uh, the HTPC form factor is common in home theater PCs. Uh, that's along the lines of an ITX form factor uh, with a low power CPU. And in a lot of cases, that really reduces the need for fans, which is important in a home theater because you don't want a noisy fan disrupting the experience. Your home theater PC needs to have improved audio capabilities. Uh, i.e. surround sound, 5.1, 7.1, 7.2, 6.2. You want a high-end sound card to output your sound to the speakers. As a general rule, they require TV tuner cards, TV tuner cards so that they can accept uh, input from your cable or satellite and output it. And that brings us to the fact that your Home theater PC should have at least one high definition media interface, one HDMI output, if not two or three. Now your home server PC, these are used for media streaming and file sharing. Uh, the CPU requirements are fairly minimal. They're not as minimal as with the home theater PC. Uh, but server requirements don't tax the, the, at least in the home, don't tax the CPU very much, so it doesn't need to be super powerful. But having a fair amount of RAM uh, 
will do you good. More RAM is better than a powerful C CPU. Uh, home server PCs usually require more and faster storage, so large, fast hard drives should be included. You might actually want to use some form of RAID, by the way, uh, if you can afford it and you have the option, you might consider a RAID 10 or a RAID 1 plus 0. So that would give you a stripe of mirrors, which gives you the best of performance and redundancy. Also, to improve throughput, uh, you might want to consider having multiple uh, network interface cards so you can bond multi multiple Ethernet channels to your network device and increase your throughput. And you can do that, um, especially if you're streaming a lot of media. So now, the key to building any custom configuration is to understand its purpose you know, what it will be used for. Be sure that you talk with your clients to fully understand what the system will be used for and understand what is important to them, not just what you know, but what's going to be important to them. Also ensure that you and the client know what the budget is. You need to know what the budget for the project is because you don't want to overspend your client's budget and have them upset fact is they may not pay you and you don't want to understand their budget. Why? Because you should also be striving to make the system as future proof as possible and still remain within the budget allotments. That means that yes you might be able to, to build the machine and have it function uh, for less than what the budget is but you're better off spending on higher quality gear to extend the life into the future of that machine. That will make the customer happy and chances are you'll get more business from that customer. There we go, that's the word I was looking for. Now that about covers it for the information in Objective 1.9. Uh, thank you for watching this webinar, for attending it, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me via email or during my office hours. Thank you very much, and I look forward to doing another one soon.